The city of Dubai is an oasis, an illusion that won't last. It's the epitome of luxury and extravagance. Towering skyscrapers, opulent hotels, the best shopping malls in the world, home to some of the worst people that have ever lived. But on the surface, Dubai is turning into a global tourism hub. More and more people are going there for holidays, for trips, to experience luxury firsthand. However, beneath the surface is a living hell, a crumbling dystopia led by a handful of wealthy individuals and families. And these are the people behind the scam that is Dubai. And so to understand all the modern issues, the slavery, the human trafficking, the extravagance, and the materialism that permeates Dubai's culture, we need to understand the people who run this place. You see, Dubai's transformation into a global metropolis can be largely attributed to one man who spent millions trying to find oil in a relatively small pearling and trading port. This was Sheikh Rashid Ibn Said al Maktoum who pretty much ruled Dubai from 1958 until 1990. After years of searching, he struck oil in 1966, and this would change the city forever. In no time, Dubai turned into one of the richest cities in the world. The oil industry allowed Dubai to invest in critical infrastructure, education, and healthcare, laying the foundations for its emergence from a developing country to one of the most significant players on the world stage. However, Sheikh Rashid recognized the potential for Dubai to evolve into more than just a city that revolved around its oil. And this was a good thing because Dubai actually doesn't have that much oil. So Rashid embarked on a new agenda to modernize the city's infrastructure, including the development of the port of Rashid, the Dubai International Airport, and the construction of modern roads and bridges. Rashid wanted to diversify Dubai's economy beyond its traditional reliance on oil, pearling, and being a tiny trading port. So he encouraged the development of new industries, particularly tourism, finance, and real estate. He wanted Dubai to become the New York of the 21st century. And so he convinced officials to make this a free trade destination. There would be no taxes, and it would be a haven for the ultra rich. And its location was almost perfect as a trade and business center for both the East and the West. And this diversification proved to be one of the most important things in Dubai's long-term economic growth and stability. And this is when all these skyscrapers started popping up over the city. It didn't matter if anybody was in them, because Dubai's elites realized that they were planning for the future and growth was inevitable. It was an incredibly expensive bet and gamble. All the oil money was invested into this, and if it didn't pay off, Dubai would crumble instantly. And it all came at a cost. Money, yes, but even more so the livelihoods of millions. Behind the facade of opulence and luxury, Dubai has become a breeding ground for modern day slavery. Slaves shipped in from countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Egypt, where the workers are promised high wages in their home countries, intending to support their families. But upon arrival in Dubai, they are coerced into signing contracts for significantly lower wages, a practice that is meant to violate UAE law. The government, however, appears to turn a blind eye to these illegal practices, which is modern day slavery. And for those who want to escape from the living hell, they can't. Not only can they not afford it, but employers will illegally confiscate their passports. They use the CAFLA system, a sponsorship system tying a worker's legal status to their employer. In fact, the city of Dubai is filled with these companies that exploit vulnerable individuals. Imagine being excited for an opportunity to help your family who are living in dire poverty, and you move across the world to support them. But then once you get there, despite all you've already done, your paycheck turns to ashes. Your entire salary goes to your food and your accommodation which your boss claims is super expensive, but usually looks like this. Many are even forced into taking on loans from their employers, making the situation dire. It's not unheard of for employers to delay paychecks for months, and when workers strike in protest, they face imprisonment due to the illegal status of strikes in the UAE. This all happens while the government of the UAE sits back and calls out slavery. In fact, slavery and people trafficking in the United Arab Emirates can be punished by life imprisonment. That's according to a law passed in 2006, according to a bill approved by a government panel. Of course, the law was written poorly. Currently, there is no minimum wage in Dubai, which is why migrant workers in Dubai earn only $175 a month. That's less than 60 cents an hour. But to Rashid Al Maktoum, it was all worth it, though it didn't last long. In 1990, Sheikh Rashid passed away and was succeeded by Muhammad's eldest brother, Maktoum. But this didn't change the dynamic, and Maktoum continued on the same idea Sheikh Rashid had. His worry wasn't about the people, and it wasn't about the money either. He was more than just somebody investing millions of his own money to create the city in the desert. When you own half the city, quite literally, you have more influence than the government. In fact, becoming a leader of the UAE for Rashid was simple. Maktoum with his cunning strategies and unbridled ambition, not only amassed immense wealth, but also strategically positioned himself within the corridors of government. He became an influential figure, 
shaping policies and decisions that furthered his interests and those of his fellow elites. They were the true rulers of Dubai, hidden behind the veneer of a seemingly progressive and prosperous city. During his span, Maktoum acted as vice president and prime minister of the UAE, and the ruler of Dubai. He owned the place and everybody knew it. If he wanted something to change, he had the power to make it happen. His wealth was a tool, and the legal system provided Maktoum with every piece he needed for his masterpiece. As Maktoum and his cohorts gained control of major corporations, their influence seeped into every crevice of the city's legislative framework, which led to his family becoming richer and richer, even though he was pumping billions into the city. The billions he funneled into the city were like a gesture, a testament to his commitment to its prosperity. By 2023, the city no longer really relies on oil as its main earning potential. Oil only accounts for 1% of its earnings. Instead, Rashid and Maktoum have turned a vast desert land into a valuable real estate, the top tourist destination of the world, one that chips and changes according to what a few elites would like in the city. Cold turkey may be great on sandwiches, but there's a better way to break your bad habits. We're not just talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor. We're talking about our sponsor Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong, so instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavoured air device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapour, Fume uses flavoured air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural delicious flavours. You get it, instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy, filling the void in a natural guilt-free way. Your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial, and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do which is really helpful for de-stressing while breaking your habit. My favourite fume flavour is the crisp mint flavoured one. When I first tried it, it was way more flavourful than I thought it would be, with the flavour feeling so fresh in the mouth, and the light flavour in my mouth also carried on into the fume's design, with its balanced beautiful wooden and fun to fidget design. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume is easy, enjoyable and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com forward slash moon or scan the QR code and use code moon to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. The Fume Solano also launched last November 6th. Launched last November 6th. So you can upgrade your journey pack to the Solano to enjoy the premium walnut barrel and onyx black coated mouthpiece that has a smoother finish and still get 10% off. That's tryfum.com and use code moon to save an additional 10% off on your order today. Dubai's legal landscape has turned into a labyrinth of favours, alliances and puppeteering. Judges who once upheld the scales of justice now found themselves entangled in the webs of privilege, all bowing to a handful of Dubai royalty. The laws were bent to accommodate the elite and justice became a commodity traded in the shadows. The Al Maktoum royal family, the Al Gora, the Al Fatim, and the Jumeirah family stand above all the others. They're the ones who own all these skyscrapers and landmarks such as the Burj Khalifa, the Palm Jumeirah, and the World Islands. The symbols of Dubai's ambition and its drive to be a global centre of tourism and business. But what happens when you have everything you could ever want and you can do whatever you want to whoever you want? Well, Dubai's leaders are the perfect example of this because for them, they take notes straight from Squid Games. The city's elite, driven by insatiable desires and shielded by immense wealth, engage in illicit activities that defy societal norms and moral boundaries. Sex parties of the vilest nature serve as playgrounds for the elite. These gatherings take place in palaces and are often hosted by wealthy sheikhs. They pay models and other influencers insane amounts of money just so they can defecate on them. More often than not, these influencers aren't even aware of what they're signing up for. They think they just need to please one man and then they get to experience the lavish lifestyle they've always dreamed of. But instead, their vulnerability becomes a currency. They're exploited and they don't have a way out once they're there. It's forced prostitution that these elite families get away with all the time. Drugs too play a prominent role in the debauchery of Dubai's elite. Exclusive circles pulsate with the illicit exchange of substances. They see this as their way to enjoy life and escape from the reality of who they are. But almost all of this goes undocumented. The workers who play a part in the process have NDAs, foes and cameras taken away from them, and all the payments are made in crypto. But all of this proves they simply have no care for human life, whether it's a model from across the world or if it's one of their own rural women. I'm not just talking about a country that isn't as advanced when it comes to women's rights. No, in Dubai, they're seen as tokens, opportunities to give their daughters to others for a greater position of power. If not, they're just locked to the side and are expected to stay silent. They don't even have the opportunity to speak out if they have frustrations, which is why it's no surprise domestic abuse is not against the law in Dubai, or while the UAE claims to be a regional leader in women's rights country's legal system still allows husbands to physically discipline their wives, something that was confirmed by the UAE Federal Supreme Court in 2010. 
But he was more than just somebody investing billions of his own money to create the city in the desert. Because when you own half the city quite literally, you have more influence than the government. And so becoming a leader of the UAE for Rashid was fairly easy. He even played a major role in the formation of the United Arab Emirates in December 2nd, 1971. That's when seven emirates came together to create a unified nation that we now know as the UAE. Rashid with his cunning strategies and unbridled ambition not only amassed immense wealth, but also strategically positioned himself within the corridors of the government. He became a hugely influential figure in the Middle East, shaping policies and decisions that furthered his interests and those of his fellow elites. They were the true rulers of Dubai, hidden behind the veneer of a seemingly progressive and prosperous city. During his span, Rashid acted as vice president and prime minister of the UAE and the ruler of Dubai. He owned the place and everybody knew it. He was the guy behind the scenes. If he wanted to change something, he had the power to make it happen. No laws could stop him doing anything, which led to his family becoming richer and richer, even though he was pumping billions into the city. Though he was saving some costs on the production in unethical ways. And we'll get onto this soon. In fact, the oil side of things was not much of a thought anymore. In 2023, oil only accounted for 1% of Dubai's total earnings. And so you would think the daughters in this family would be able to live their dream life, since their family has more money than you could ever imagine. But they're really not happy and they want out. In fact, they're actually terrified for their life. One of the princesses in particular has tried to get away from her living hell. Sure, this could be an isolated incident. Perhaps she doesn't know what life is like in the real world. And it's easy to think this until you hear of what's really happening behind the scenes in Dubai. This is Princess Latifa, the daughter of the ruler of Dubai, who's tried to escape attempts from her family's control and her subsequent detention for decades. In 2002, at the age of 16, Latifa made her first attempt at escape, fleeing Dubai to Oman with the help of a Finnish friend. However, she was captured by Indian naval forces and returned to Dubai, where she faced years of confinement and restrictions on her freedom. For the most part, nobody knew about this at all. She barely had any opportunities to make her situation known. So for many years, all she knew was suppression at its finest. She was locked in a villa surrounded by police. She could never go outside to get fresh air and she apparently had no health care either. She felt like a hostage and that her life was not in her hands. And so in 2018, with no other option, Latifa took her chances for a second time. This time on a more daring escape attempt, planning to reach the United States and seek asylum. So she would join forces with Hervé Jorbert, a French national and former French spy. Together, they planned to sail across the Indian Ocean to India and then fly to the United States. The escape plan initially seemed to be going smoothly. They successfully left Dubai on a yacht and spent several days sailing towards India. However, on March 11th, 2018, just off of the coast of India, the yacht was intercepted by Indian Special Forces and Emirati Commandos. Latifa and Jobeth were forcibly removed from the yacht and taken back to Dubai. And upon her return to Dubai, Latifa was reportedly detained in a villa and subjected to further restrictions on her freedom. She was denied any access to her family and friends, and her communications were tightly controlled. In 2019, Latifa's story gained international attention after BBC Panorama had a documentary featuring videos recorded by Latifa prior to her second escape attempt. In the videos, Latifa spoke about her desire for freedom and her deep-seated fear of her father. So yeah, I, they caught me at the border basically and then they found out who I was. They brought me back to Dubai and um, my father's right-hand man put me in prison under my father's orders and then his uh, all his CID guys, they, um, yeah, they, they put me in prison and they tortured me. Um, basically, one guy was holding me while the other guy was beating me. And they did that repeatedly. Uh, I think the first time they tortured me, I didn't feel any pain because I was in so much shock. She also alleged that she had been subjected to physical and emotional abuse during her previous confinement. The release of the video sparked international concern about Latifa's well-being and calls for her release. The United Nations Human Rights Committee urged the UAE government to provide information about Latifa's whereabouts and conditions of detention. In response to the international scrutiny, the UAE government has maintained that Latifa is safe and well and is receiving all the care she needs. However, Latifa's family has not allowed her to make any public appearances or communicate freely with her supporters. But most don't buy it and believe she's still being oppressed, all to keep up the image of Dubai. Which brings me to the final point. The entire city of Dubai is fake. In all its glory of what Dubai is portrayed to be, it is simply as hollow as its heart. I mean, if you compare Dubai to a city it aspires to be like New York, it just doesn't compare. Now, New York obviously has its issues, but at least they're real. New York has a rich history and diverse culture. It evolved organically over centuries. Its skyline punctuated by landmarks like the Statue of Liberty in 
the Empire State Building reflects its growth, struggle and innovation. The city has been carefully designed and its people have grown to love it so much. In contrast to Baitan into the city it is today in just 50 years, there is no history or culture, but it is a place that fake influencers who value money above all else seem to love. And it's no surprise, the entire city is just an ambitious mega project with its highest value property on the artificial islands, ironically proving how artificial the top of Dubai is. And I mean the infrastructure of the city hasn't even been planned out properly. There's awful traffic jams everywhere in Dubai, not to mention the awful sewage and drainage system. Just last month, the city saw its worst flood ever, something that was barely surprising as the city drainage infrastructure had been criticised for years already. This is why, after just 30 minutes of mild rain, the drainage infrastructure fails and roads turn into ponds. Whilst this is a rare occasion, it obviously shows the lack of thought behind how Dubai was actually built. Not to mention the fact that this rain is often artificial anyway, being completely manufactured just like the Truman Show. And all of this comes from the fact that the soul of the city just doesn't really exist. If we look at what makes New York great, it's not just the buildings. The heartbeat of New York is found in its people. There's a dynamic blend of cultures, backgrounds and stories. The city thrives on its neighbourhoods, each with a distinct character and charm. It's a city forged over generations. To them, New York has a profound sense of belonging and shared identity. And New Yorkers share a genuine love for their city and their attachment goes beyond mere economic considerations. And the same is true for places like London as well. As residents actively participate in the city's cultural, social and civic life that fosters some sense of belonging in community even if it is rather limited. But when it comes to the facade of Dubai, there is just no soul or culture. It's just a barren desert luxury prison with nothing to do other than to shop. Filled by an underbelly of slaves who are doing everything they can to get out of the place. They don't love the city and they don't even want to be there. And if you ask anyone who's been there, they always say that the soul is missing. And the whole city's skyline is just a testament to how Dubai was built in the first place. It is all manufactured out of one man's ambition for more power. Its main sites like the Burj Khalifa just stands as a towering symbol of the vapid empty plastic culture that permeates the city. While its height is undeniably impressive, it does really nothing for its cultural heritage. There's no real reason for it other than to be big. Similarly the Palm Islands, often seen as a triumph of human ingenuity, one of the most luxurious places on the world, just seems to be a project of tasteless extravagance. These artificial islands, shaped into palm trees visible from space, are more of a gimmick than a thoughtful addition to the city's landscape, representing a missed opportunity to create something that is both innovative and culturally resonant. Instead they stand as an epitome of environmental disregard, vacuousness, atomization, and built for the sake of grandeur rather than to enrich the city's cultural fabric. And the result is a bland, uniform aesthetic that permeates the city, lacking any nuance or intricacies of traditional Emirati and Islamic art art and architecture, instead of community, parks, beauty, elegance and culture, you get gigantic shopping malls, over the top luxury hotels and just a playground for the wealthy and powerful rather than a city to actually live in. And this fake plastic facade also extends to the influencers who love this place. Most of the women seem to be involved with borderline prostitution, paid to be there by the rich, and the others live in the slums of the city but drive around to take photos and pretend their life is so good. And the government's control over the city's image is so stringent that influencers who dare to expose the harsh reality risk arrest or deportation. This is why you don't even see that much criticism against Dubai, because of the authoritarian control behind the entire thing. I mean you can even get a fine for having a dirty car or using a VPN or even taking a photo of an accident in the city, or to keep the image squeaky clean. And this manipulation extends to media, acting as a shield for the numerous hidden truths. The unspoken rule is clear, don't speak about extreme poverty as it contradicts the polished image Dubai wants to project globally. The UAE's include and the Human Rights Watch already signal serious concerns, and they want nothing to do with it. That's because the government's involvement goes beyond turning a blind eye to the slavery issue. They are integral to the issue. Dubai's very foundation, even government-run buildings and jobs use modern day slavery. This is the backbone, this is what affords them to have no tax. And government data reveals a staggering 96% of the employed population in the city is compromised of immigrant workers. And of course, these are not all slaves, but a substantial percentage actually are. And so for them to make any change to their economic system, System would be an economic suicide in the city. But that then begs the question, how long can all of this last? I mean the city is completely contradictory to what it was meant to be. There is no authenticity. It is a hellhole where the temperatures reach 41 degrees celsius daily. There is no trees, greenery and even the weather is subject to manipulation. Dubai researchers are inducing artificial rainfall by employing drones to generate electrical charges, thereby manipulating the weather and prompting precipitation throughout the desert nation. And aside from a couple of skyscrapers, Dubai is not a New York, it's not a London is not a Tokyo. Dubai is an illusion that is sustained by its foundation of illusions, making the city a ticking time bomb.